Uh, good afternoon. My name is Rachel Callanan. I'm the Clerk Assistant Procedure in the Department of the Senate. Welcome to today's lecture. This is the first in our Senate lecture series for 2023. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the Canberra area, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, and pay respect to their elders past and present. Today's lecture is being live streamed on the Australian Parliament House website and it's also being Ausland interpreted and captioned. If time permits, at the end of a lecture, we'll also facilitate a brief Q&A session. I'm very pleased today to welcome our lecturer, Dr. Maria Taflaga. Dr. Taflaga is a senior lecturer in the School of Politics and International Relations and the director of the Australian Politics Studies Centre at the Australian National University. She researches Australian political history and Australian politics in comparison to other nations that draw on the Westminster system. As part of her current Australia Research Council Discovery Project called Pathways to Power Australian Political Careers, Dr. Taflaga is researching the career paths of Australian politicians. Her work also focuses on the interaction between politicians and institutions such as political parties, parliament and the executive and she also has strong interest in gender and politics. But in today's lecture, Dr. Taflaga will explore how we understand and describe Australia's system of executive legislative relations, with a particular attention to the important institutional role of the Australian Senate. Would you please join me in welcoming Dr. Taflaga. Thanks very much everyone for having me here today and uh, it's really quite pleasant to see so many people turn out for what should be a relatively uh, you know, heavy theory based talk about um, Australia's parliamentary system. Anyway, uh, you know, why are we, this is working, okay, this is working great. Anyway, thanks very much for having me and um, so why are we here? Um, now, one of the things that has always kind of interested me about uh, the Australian political system is the fact that we've always had a hard time uh, finding a proper name uh, to describe our system because of the role of the Senate um, and how that has altered the sort of what we call the executive legislative uh, relations. And so there's been many names uh, formulated to describe our system. You might have heard of Elaine Thomas's The Washminster Mutation, which was very popular. We've also had uh, the sort of term strong bicameralism thrown around, i.e. a strong upper house or strong two-party dynamic. But my absolute favourite um, was formulated by a guy called Stanley Back, who was American, who came out here to, to do a, actually an excellent job of, of really describing the Senate. And he simply couldn't come up with a proper label. He described our system as not parliamentary. And I think, uh, yeah, and I think this does, oh wait, what's going on? Why doesn't this work? Oh dear, is it not on? Here we go. This worked before. Oh no, it's going, it's going, great, okay. Oh, it's not on my screen. Okay, okay, all right. That's a little disconcerting for me, that's okay. And this dilemma, I think, uh, of what is our system, the fact that it's, well, it's not parliamentary, right, um, sort of encapsulated uh, the dilemma uh, that I was sort of faced when I was invited to participate in a symposium from another outsider who came to Australia to sort of uh, learn from our system and to sort of think about how the, uh, um, the, the presence of the Senate and its, its strong powers impact legislative, uh, legislative, executive legislative relations. And this was a guy called um, Stefan Ganghoff, who was from the University of Potsdam. And, um, and he had basically been developing this idea of what he called a semi-parliamentary system. And he essentially asked me, as an Australian politics nerd, uh, whether or not I was sort of, um, you know, what I would, would I comment on it? Which sort of led to, um, you know, this special issue. And at first, I have to say, I was pretty sceptical about the idea of a semi-parliamentary system. You know, do we really need yet another name? another typology, another set of labels to describe the political system. Because I've sort of already told you, like, there's already um, many that you can choose from. I only kind of gave you a small selection. 
However, I have to admit that as I sort of engaged with um, Mr. Ganghoff's work or Professor Ganghoff's work, I, I did become to be quite uh, convinced uh, that he is right, that, the, that Australia is a semi-parliamentary system and that it actually kind of does matter that we understand this. And that's essentially what I will be doing today. Most people, even in my department, have never heard of semi-parliamentarism, and that's fair enough. Sometimes they ask me what it is, um, you know, which is always a great opportunity for me to explain that um, to them. But uh, so that sort of sort of forms the core of what I want to do today. What is a semi-parliamentary system and why should you care? And at the end of it, hopefully you retain one, one reason to care. So, uh, you know, in essence, um, why should we care about this? Well, I think uh, the dismissal crisis is a really good example. So it's 1975, it's November 1975. The Whitlam government is in a massive uh, deadlock with the um, with the uh, Liberal Coalition or the Liberal Country Party Coalition uh, over the budget. You know, most of you would kind of be sort of familiar with this history, so I don't want to belabor um, the point here. But, you know, we've actually already seen one political crisis emerge in which uh, the government at the time, the Whitlam government, was forced to an election to resolve a deadlock over the budget. And uh, for those of you that are not so familiar with this history, you know, in essence, the uh, Liberal Coalition uh, kind of tried these tactics on again and sort of went further down the line um, in doing so in 1975. And the reason why I want to draw your attention to the 1975 political constitutional crisis, because it was both political and constitutional, is that it essentially boiled down to the fact that not all the actors did not agree on what the rules of the game were, what the norms should be, and how deadlocks or uh, you know crises should be resolved. There was a lack of agreement, and and it was sort of actually came across on three different levels. The, the first, which is actually very important but not so relevant to this particular talk, is simply that the Liberal Country Party just didn't believe that the Labor government was legitimate and that it had a right to occupy office. That's very important, but not so important for our executive political legislation. Like, you know, technically that, well, that problem could come up in any political system, no matter what the design, you know. So we'll put that one aside, though, you know, it's important to understanding that crisis. The second is that there was a profound dispute between the houses and between actors in both houses over what powers the Senate actually had. And if you look at debate at the time, a lot of the argument, both during the crisis and after the crisis, did actually circulate on whether or not the Senate even had the powers to, to effectively do what it did, which was to essentially exercise its sort of, um, its near absolute veto power on budget legislation. And so that is also very important to understanding um, the, the sort of crisis uh, that emerged and is kind of directly related to the problem of what is a semi-parliamentary system. And, it, and it, it comes in the third problem with not understanding, not all the actors understanding the political system that they're in, that I think the problem of having the wrong name for your political system becomes apparent. And that is because, and this is the bit of, um, I think, the sort of dismissal crisis that people are less familiar with, is that when Whitlam was sacked, what he did was go back to the lodge and fry up steaks with his close political confidence. And over a lot of red meat, they wargamed what they should do next. What they didn't do was tell the Senate leadership team that they had been sacked. And their solution was a brilliant one in the sense that it really worked well in what we would call a parliamentary system. They deduced that Fraser, the then opposition leader who had just been appointed prime minister by Sir John Kerr, the governor general, didn't actually have a majority on the floor of the House of Representatives, which means he could not maintain the confidence of the House, which means he could not fulfill the role of a responsible government, a government that can maintain the confidence of the lower chamber. And so having lost the confidence of that lower chamber, Kerr would be faced with the incredibly difficult position of having just sacked a prime minister and having had one sacked by the legislature, which is the logic of a parliamentary system. And that is actually what the Whitlam government or the Whitlam, you know, Whitlam did, and it worked really well. The problem was, is as I said, sort of said before, is that no one told the Senate leadership team what had actually happened. And so when Reg Withers and, you know, the other uh, Liberal senators sort of said, we're ready to pass your budget, 
they thought, great, you know, they've cracked under the pressure and they're going to do the right thing and they're going to vote through the budget. And so the budget passed. And so in essence, the political crisis in effect had been resolved because what was at stake was the fact that the government without any money coming through would literally enter a shutdown. And, you know, we've seen other countries, uh, you know, enter such a political state and it's not great uh, for the system. But because the budget had been passed, even though Fraser was not able to maintain the confidence of the lower house, the budget was passed. And so they could go straight to an election and resolve this problem, this political crisis in the more usual way, which is via an election. And so Kerr was extremely lucky that he didn't actually end up in, um, well, the soup in effect. And why did this happen? In essence, because Whitlam didn't fully understand the political system, the norms the, and the logics and the rule sets and who has what powers and what can, how it can all operate and function together. Because he was thinking he was operating in a parliamentary system, he didn't really consider the Senate in, in the dilemma that had arisen. And in essence, it, the, that chamber in effect outmaneuvered him and he was forced into an election that, in, in, you know, to be fair, he was about to call himself. But that's why labels matter. It actually matters if we all kind of understand what page we're on. And so, you know, that is in essence, I hope, like uh, an illustrative example of, you know, the, the, the boring theory I'm about to take you through um, actually uh, does matter. Now, some of you are probably sceptical and I think that's fair. Um, but I'm going to give you two reasons uh, why this, this should matter to you. The, the first is, um, uh, a reason beloved of political scientists, which is that, you know, descriptions and, and labels matter. You know, if we, if we come to agree that there can be black and white swans, we are doing a better job of reflecting uh, reality. And when we're talking about practical politics, if we all agree and understand the system and the logics and the rules that we are operating in and what can actually occur and what is not able to occur, it means that we can help to resolve disputes. And the 75 crisis is a really good illustrative example of that. But it can also help us to diagnose problems or things that we don't like about our political system that we would like to change. Um, and, you know, and that is um, a conversation that is always running in a political system at any time. And finally, um, you know, this is the one that is really more relevant to scholars, but it allows us to have meaningful comparison and learning if we actually understand that when we compare Australia with the UK that um, you know the, the comparison isn't a one-to-one -one. and in effect you know political scholars have always kind of understood this because you know they have a sort to generate names to describe the disturbing qualities of the Senate or the, the way it kind of disrupts things. Um, but it's, you know, uh, none of those labels have done, I think, a very good job of really kind of um, being general enough that we can move beyond just describing Australia. Okay. A second reason why you should care is that it relates ultimately to the normative possibilities that as citizens, right, rather than just scholars, uh, that we might want to sort of consider as we consider where our political institutions are at, how well they're working, whether or not we're actually satisfied with the type of, you know, representation, scrutiny work and deliberation that our Parliament is actually currently offering us. And, you know, polling kind of suggests that people are rather grumpy and not sort of satisfied. And the reason why us understanding that we actually operate in a semi-parliamentary system rather than a parliamentary one kind of comes down to the fact that, um, and I'm going to explain this uh, to you and spend a bit of time trying to explain this to you so it sort of makes sense, is that we actually um, have a lot more scope for, uh, you know, normative uh, possibilities or experimentation than we probably think we do. And so I'll explain what I mean by this. And that is, you know, rhetorically, when we go to vote and the major parties warn us to not imperil stable government, um, 
that is one of the kind of core values uh, of a, you know, in essence, that a parliamentary system is able to deliver. And we're kind of constantly told that we should, uh, you know, not uh, endanger the ability to have a stable government because, you know, stable governments are just, quote, inherently good. And the other kind of sort of dimension of that is when we look at other countries around the world, the ones that are sort of most typically kind of brought to mind might be something like New Zealand, which has a proportional representation system. And we're kind of told, well, you know, you can either have stable government or you can have a really strong representative legislature. And this is actually just not true. And that is because of the logics of our political system, which is, I'm going to argue, semi-parliamentary. And that ultimately, actually, we already have a political system that is very well geared to maximise both stability and representation. And you should all be really excited about this. This is this is super cool, guys. Um, so let's sort of walk through this, okay? So what is semi-parliamentary anyway? I'm, I'm about to present you with a sort of what we call a minimal definition, so um, of an ideal type. So a minimal definition is like the, the minimum criteria required and an ideal type is like the textbook case rather than reality, okay? Um, now, um, we're going to revisit this definition, so don't worry if you don't take it all in in the first time. But in essence, you, you need three things. One is that no part of the executive is elected directly. That is the, the government, right? The prime minister of the cabinet. The prime minister and the cabinet are selected by an assembly with two parts. We're gonna talk about this a lot. Only one, in our case, the House of Representatives, can dismiss the cabinet um, in a no confidence vote. And I sort of explained a little bit about why no confidence votes were so important when we were talking about the Whitlam dismissal example. The final bit is, is that even though the other part, in this case the Senate, has equal or even greater democratic legitimacy and a robust veto power, uh, over, uh, it must have, one of the, have these two things over ordinary legislation, i.e. it's actually got to be a credible adversary is essentially what that boils down to. Okay. So now that I've told you those things, I'm going to, for some of you, tell you things you already know, and for others, um, perhaps, um, kind of give you a framework in which to sort of understand some of the things I've just said. So when we kind of think about executive legislative relationships, i.e. essentially, you know, um, how a legislature relates to the bit that actually makes all the decisions, um, the executive, we have two family types. We have parliamentary systems and presidential systems. Uh, and they have, they tend to function in very different ways and they have very different logics, you know. So, I mean, a lot of you would know about US politics and I'm sure you're cluey enough to kind of get that the political system there just operates on entirely different logic because uh, of the way that, you know, the separation of powers is functioning, the fact that the president has a, a popular uh, mandate of his own, our prime minister doesn't, right? You know, our prime minister is not um, voted for by the entire country. And so that, that just shapes um, how power operates in these two different systems. And we tend to sort of think of, in very general terms, that they have very different strengths, right? Um, so in the case of parliamentary systems, uh, they, they tend to be a lot better at delivering what we kind of like to call clear lines of accountability. And that's because the legislature can sack the prime minister um, through a no confidence vote. Now, that doesn't really happen that much really in today's world but it is very much how the legislature was uh, established and uh, it certainly did matter before the two-party system was solidified in 1910 and it's absolutely how the political system, the parliamentary system uh, in the United Kingdom that we adopted operated. Um, and the other kind of major um, advantage parliamentary systems tend to have is that they tend to be a lot more flexible and adaptive but this is not universally true. Presidential systems by the same, uh, by the same, oh, sorry, presidential systems on the other hand, uh, you know, they don't tend to have the same um, clear lines of accountability, but, you know, they do have greater popular legitimacy. They do a good job of having a really institutionalised and formalised set of separations of powers, whereas in our case it can be more blurred. And depending on what you want, you might think this is a good thing or a bad thing. The actual weaknesses though, the major downsides is in the parliamentary system, uh, in essence, because the executive is drawn from the legislature, right? So, you know, you've got to be in the legislature to be the prime minister or to be the treasurer. You can't be appointed from outside. Uh, it just essentially kind of means that 
in our case in particular in Australia, that the, the legislature doesn't do a good job of being a legislature. Like it's not very good at actually conducting meaningful debate. It's not very good at scrutinising itself. Uh, and it's not um, very good at always doing a good representational uh, job because it becomes preoccupied with being a confidence chamber for the Prime Minister, ensuring that the Prime Minister and the Cabinet stay in control of the legislature. Now that's not universally the case, but that is definitely the, the major downside. Whereas, you know, the, the sort of pathologies, I suppose, of presidential systems are that they concentrate power in the hands of uh, one person and that the sort of solution to this term limits really can lower accountability because, you know, once they've got their second term, like, what are you going to do? And, you know, and you also get the sort of lame duck problem. Okay. So, and I guess when we think about the weaknesses of a parliamentary system, I think in your mind's eye, I assume you are imagining what goes on in the House of Representatives, which, you know, is not very edifying most of the time. And the debate there is, you know, not nearly as robust as it might be in the Senate. The important thing to kind of understand about parliamentary systems is that they actually typically favour one set of normative practices over another. People tend to sort of think about trade-offs. And this is what I was alluding to before when I said, you know, rhetorically, one of, the, one of the main kinds of reasons that we're told that we shouldn't tinker too much with our system is because we have to trade off between efficiency norms, which I'll explain in a sec, and representational norms, right, around proportionality. And so, and, and when you look around the world, you sort of see that this actually is kind of how institutions have evolved. So, you know, our system is generally, or, you know, the Westminster tradition, if you look around the world, is typically more geared towards efficiency. So we have clearer lines of accountability. It's really easy to know who is at fault. Uh, whereas in parliamentary systems in Europe, for example, which are based on proportional representation systems, coalition governments are formed, many voices are joined to come up with policy, uh, you know, outcomes that may be sort of suboptimal, and it might be hard, but you know, more people agree, so that's a good thing. But also it might be really hard to work out who is actually to blame, because was it the government's party or was it their coalition partner or was it because of a deal done when the coalition was sort of formed? Um, okay. So, so they're the kinds of things that I kind of want you to sort of retain in your mind. And from a sort of nerd political science perspective, basically uh, by 1980, political scientists kind of realised that our two families, whilst doing a very good job of describing really broad phenomena, were not doing so good a job of describing um, specific country cases because there's too much variation. And so, a, a, you know, a really famous guy called Maurice de Verger, who, you know, did a lot of things in political science, came up with the concept of a semi-presidential system, which is is, you know, not always a, an easy system for an executive to exist in, but basically this means that a prime minister and a president share executive power. You don't really need to know about this. It's here to sort of demonstrate ultimately that, um, oh no, where are we up to? Oh God. Um, is, this is not working. Yeah, so this hasn't been changing for a while. Oh. You poor people, you have probably been really confused. Okay, so yeah, sorry. Okay, so that was just the visual representation of the difference, like parliamentary systems produce one or the other pathology in general textbook terms. Um, and this is where I want to get to, which is that um, for a lot longer, we have been satisfied that parliamentary systems do a good job of describing like all of the parliamentary systems out there. And in essence, um, you know, Perhaps this is not the case. So let's revisit, aha, uh -huh, great. Let's revisit this minimal definition that I uh, gave you of a semi-parliamentary system and let's break it down. Okay, so the first part, that no part of the executive is directly elected, okay? So essentially this means that only one mandate is being sought by voters, in effect, to produce the prime minister um, or the executive, unlike a semi-presidential system where a prime minister and a president are effectively sharing power, right, executive power, um, and which can create rivalries and can create really like problematic um, breakdowns of cooperation, which can happen in, in France, for example. Uh, so we only have one uh, area that is actually sort of seeking 
um, a mandate to form the executive, the bit of government that actually spends money, sends people to war, makes actual decisions, um, you know, the bit that is, it is in charge, okay? Uh, and that, you know, this is essentially in our system run through a chain of delegation. So we elect our legislatures, our legislatures are select, select the cabinet in theory, right? And the prime minister in theory. Uh, and then they go on to form the executive and tell the bureaucracy what to do. Um, you know, sometimes they pass laws, sometimes they govern by legislation because they have a hard time passing laws, right? Um, but they have all of those um, powers. Um, and, you know, essentially this is good because you don't have uh, rival sources of executive uh, power and that the, the, the executive is responsible to the legislature who knows more about laws and what is actually going on than we do as voters, right? So this is good, theoretically, right? In theory. Happy days. Okay, secondly, the second part, that the Prime Minister and Cabinet are selected by the Assembly, which has two parts, okay? Only one of which can dismiss the Cabinet in a no confidence vote. In this case, this is the House of Representatives. If the Senate doesn't like the Prime Minister, it doesn't matter, does it, okay? They can't, they can't fire the government. Only the lower house can fire the government. And the important bit is that it's actually just two parts. It doesn't have to be two chambers. In our case, it is two chambers, but you could actually construct a semi-parliamentary system uh, unicamerally, okay, so, i.e. one chamber. And one way you could do this is just, just for example, say you could turn the entire country, I'm not saying you should do this, but you can do this, and I, I want you to understand this so, it, so you don't get caught up in the idea that it's about two chambers. So you could, for example, set up an entire electorate uh, that is just the whole country, we all vote in for, you know, in the one electorate we pick our candidates or parties or however we do it. And we could sort of say, for example, sake that in order to get, we could make it directly proportional, so if you get 10 10% of the vote, you get 10% of the seats, which is very democratically equitable, okay? And we could sort of say, you've got to get 2% of the vote to kind of keep out the absolute kind of crazy riff-raff party, pirate party, all of those kinds of people you see on, a, on the New South Wales Senate ballot, for example. Um, and, and, and that part of the chamber elects the bit that is effectively the legislature, the bit that is representational, right? So it's doing actually a really good job of representing the country because if you got 10% of the vote, you're getting 10% of the seats, right? That's, that's proportionate. Uh, and that it's also um, doing, um, you know, yes, yeah, it's doing a good job of being representational. But you could then also, for example, say that, well, in order to be part of the legislature that can sack the government, the executive, the cabinet, the prime minister, you needed to get more of the vote. You needed to get 10% of the vote, 15 or 20%. You wouldn't want to make it too high because um, then you might find no one gets that threshold. And so therefore, you know, that would be the parties we would expect to be forming government because they have the largest share of votes. Mo more people have confidence in them to form a government. And so therefore, they're more likely um, to uh, not only like form stable governments in effect, right, uh, because they're uh, accumulating larger vote shares, uh, but they also can perform on different uh, essential logics. And so the fact that they really only care about maintaining power means that they're still a part of the legislature that is not involved in those confidence decisions and so therefore can really focus on being um, really good at the sort of deliberative, scrutineering and representational um, dimensions. And hopefully some of you are sort of tweaking to the fact, well, that's kind of what our Senate does, okay, because it really doesn't have a stake in maintaining the confidence of the Cabinet. It, it has no ability to impact that. And so it has actually kind of evolved and gone down very different kind of deliberative and normative practices compared to the lower house. The problem we kind of have is that we have an awful lot of representatives, more of them, in the lower house, which, because of party discipline because that chamber, that part of the legislature is focused on a confidence college, is not doing those jobs, you know. And it's not just because of the political system, it's other reasons too, which I'll go on to explain. Okay, so, um, so that's why the sort of two parts thing is actually really quite important, um, that it's not just about it being two chambers. The final bit is uh, that, um, the other part of the Senate, right, oh, sorry, the other part of the legislature, in our case the Senate, has equal or greater democratic legitimacy and a robust veto power over ordinary legislation, okay? That means it's actually a credible opponent 
to the part of the legislative system that is effectively responsible for government. If you look at the UK or Canada, for example, which has a, an appointed upper house, the, the, those upper chambers are toothless tigers. If the government can ram through legislation in the bottom in the, in the lower chamber, that legislation is passed. And so it really depends on what happens in that lower chamber as to whether or not anyone says, oh, I think this is actually a terrible idea and you should go ahead and reconsider that, okay? And so in a way, our Senate has effectively um, acquired these or, you know, uses these powers. And so that's why that kind of matters. So what does this sort of look like in a textbook sense? You've got voters who are effectively, this is a semi-parliamentary system in a textbook sense, right? You've got voters who are electing two different mandate groups, right? One, which is the chamber confident, uh, the, the confidence chamber, the one that is basically responsible for selecting the prime minister in the cabinet, and the other one, which is the legislative chamber, the one that is actually doing the job of a legislature, representing us, scrutinising government, knowing stuff about what is actually going on and, and conducting meaningful and uh, you know, robust debates. Okay? In Australia, in effect, this looks like this, right? Uh, we do have people from the Senate forming or be becoming part of the cabinet, right? We can't have the prime minister by convention, um, though, you know, technically that could change. Um, um, but importantly, the Senate can't fire the the cabinet. Only the House can do that. And, and if you actually look at the way, uh, you know, we come to sort of feel about which part of the legislature is sort of doing the job of the legislature, I think we all kind of intuitively know that the Senate is the bit that is doing the better job. So if we kind of think about it in terms of that sort of minimal definition and a bunch of criterion, um, you know, here we can kind of sort of look at it in a bit more depth. And a bunch of you are probably thinking like, well, this is all well and good, Maria, but I'm still kind of dissatisfied with how the Senate kind of operates. Um, you know, like I still don't think that like, you know, you're saying that this semi-parliamentary system is so great because it can maximise stability and majority and uh, representational values, but you know, I'm not satisfied. And, and that's, you know, and this might be an answer, which is, uh, or at least a partial answer, which is that um, the, the, the Senate actually only fulfills sort of three out of sort of six kinds of ways that we might measure a semi-parliamentary system. And this comes from Professor Ganghoff's work, who basically concluded that semi-parliamentary systems exist in Australia, most Australian states and Japan. Um, but hopefully more to come, guys. Like, you know, it's a great system. Um, whereas, uh, you know, New South Wales pretty much matches all of these criterion uh, now after its sort of reforms in um, the late 1970, uh, 1970s. Um, so, no. So, what are the kind of implications for this? Like, why have I kind of bored you to death with all of this uh, detail? And it's for what I've sort of been trying to kind of um, allude to is that. Actually, right now, our political system is very well set up to do both jobs well. So, um, you know, the House of Representatives is really good at being a confidence college. Like, we could, we could argue it's too good and that there are too many people in the lower house doing the job of a confidence college and not enough people in, the, in our Senate doing the job of a legislative, deliberative, scrutineering, representational body. And, um, and that we, um, we wouldn't actually be upending the sort of fundamental structure of our political system if we chose to um, mess around with the current dynamic we have doesn't mean that we wouldn't have unintended consequences. That's actually really important to understand. But this idea that we would have to give up one thing for another is simply not the case. We're actually already set up to do this. So what might we want from our political system? And so some of the ways that we tend to think about this are through norms. They, they, they're categorised under two basic groups. I've already alluded to a bunch of them. But I'll go through them in a bit more detail here. We've got sort of, you know, the efficiency dimension, you know, government produces results uh, quickly that we can all kind of understand versus, uh, you know, government is um, aggregating and accounting for the full range of opinions out in society. And so we might think about efficiency um, 
efficiency norms under three kind of labels. One is what we like to be able to call um, identifiability. This just means that I can work out by voting for Labor or, or Liberal, for example, um, what the policy difference will be, uh, as opposed to um, not really knowing who to vote for and understanding what outcome I'll get. Uh, parliamentary systems or efficient, efficient norms tend to sort of produce uh, clearer choices for voters. Not necessarily clear choices, but clearer choices. Uh, the second is cabinet stability, which we've talked a great deal about, which has, um, you know, an obvious, I think we can all kind of understand why a stable government is um, potentially of great normative value in the sense that it um, can get on with a sustained project of uh, work and at the end can be held accountable for the things that it did and which relates to the third one here which is clarity of responsibility. I gave you that example of um, being able to understand who is to blame and so I think when we look at sort of the political crisis in the United Kingdom it's really easy for us to determine which party is to blame for the current political system or the current political situation in the United Kingdom because they have been in power, one party in effect, uh, since 2015 and they were in coalition from 2010 but they were the dominant player, right? Uh, and it's been such a long time now that I think we can all safely say that this happened on the Tories' watch and the Tories are to blame. Whereas if you look at, you know, uh, Denmark, for example, which is sort of like the poster child for representation, um, you know, you get uh, different kind of governing coalitions that then might also, uh, in effect, uh, to pass legislation or programs, kind of make small or short-term compacts with other parties. And that's definitely great for representation, but understanding for the average voter who is actually to blame for the state of Denmark, which I'm, sh I'm assuming is great, I don't know, um, is harder for voters to determine, okay? So that's what that norm means. The second set of norms relate to representation. Some of these should be really familiar to you and I've already kind of talked about the obvious one being proportionality, okay? You know, we don't have um, the strongest proportionality um, in our system. You know, we've had several elections in the last 25 years in which the party that won the majority of the votes didn't actually win government, okay? So that's a problem of proportionality and arguably quite a serious one. Um, the second one relates to dimensionality, which is quite abstract. Um, um, and in essence, it's just how well the political system kind of is able to capture the multiplicity or multiple dimensional views of voters. So voters have complex views. How well can the political system um, do this? One way to handle this is size. So our Senate being smaller means, uh, which is the bit that does a better deliberative representational scrutinizing job, the fact that it's smaller than the House, that's a dimensionality problem, okay? And the final one is flexibility, and I, I alluded to this in my last example about Denmark. You know, a government in Denmark, it might hold on to power with a, a minimum winning coalition, um, like the, the smallest number of people it needs to cooperate, but it might struggle to get, you know, legislation X or Y passed, so it forms a coalition with someone else, okay? So the flexibility. And that's good because ultimately it means that more voices are being heard in the construction of legislation and government policy. The, 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 the fact that governments feel they can do this and not be kind of criticised for, you know, um, getting into bed with the Greens, which is one we hear a lot in our system, um, you know, that's normatively actually quite a good thing. Okay. So these are, you know, often these are presented as normative trade-offs and some of them are zero sum, but a lot of them aren't, okay. And here I think is a good visual demonstration of what I'm talking about. So here I sort of sort of uh, mentioned, right, you got the sort of the UK, that's the poster child for the efficient political system. And Denmark is the poster child for the absolutely representational political system. And what these spider webs are, are essentially those six uh, normative values I just walked you through and how well these political systems map onto those. And you can kind of see that the UK is really good at delivering efficient government. We all know who to blame. Uh, the government can get its legislative program through so long as its backbench doesn't revolt. And um, I've forgotten the last one. Um, oh yeah, and the governments are really stable, okay. But it's actually pretty terrible at the sort of representational um, norms. Like it, it, it's not really even getting past zero. Denmark, on the other hand, is um, much better at proportionality. Like there are 10 parties there, you know, you can find the type of party that probably fits your views 
really neatly, right? Um, you probably feel satisfied in your vote uh, compared to the UK, for example. Um, and, and it does an okay job at stability, but it's not doing so great at the other sort of efficiency kind of uh, values. This is what a, like the Commonwealth looks like and New South Wales, okay? New South Wales, which is considered the ideal type, i.e. it meets the textbook definition. The Commonwealth, which is sort of meeting the minimum kind of threshold um, and not doing so well on the sort of secondary sort of dimension, um, you know. But as you can see, we're doing actually a great deal better than the UK and arguably, uh, you know, uh, we're like, um, arguably within the sort of we're moving into the ballpark of, of Denmark, okay? Um, you know, do, could we do better? Absolutely. But I think this is an important way to kind of understand what I was trying to sort of say, which is, you know, politicians sort of say, well, you know, um, you can either have representational outcomes or you can have stability, but actually right now with anyone, without anyone really understanding it, our political system is already delivering better results than we probably think on all of these normative dimensions. And we wouldn't actually have to revolutionise everything to extend them out into the proportional area, okay? There's lots of things we could, we could potentially do to maximise or to improve proportional outcomes. Now, some of you might be wondering, okay, but like why, uh, you know, this is all good in theory, but like why doesn't this actually work in um, reality or why do I feel crappy about politics? And in essence, um, that's because of political parties, right? So when we're talking about executive legislative relations in the literature, we're often always thinking in the kind of really simple kind of terms like voters elect a legislative member, right? And we often discount the role of parties as really critical actors in how legislatures actually function. I mean, the reality is since 1910, in essence, it is political parties that are interpreting, uh, inventing and enacting all the stuff that happens in our chambers. They, they have an incredible amount of influence over the operation of these institutions, even though democratic or like legislative theory, you know, um, talks about them as if they didn't, doesn't, don't exist. I have spent the last half hour talking to you about legislatures as if parties don't exist, right? So you can, this is why we have this gap, right? And parties are operating on really different logics to an individual legislature. And, you know, I think if we think about the independence or an independent member, we can get a sense of this, okay? So, you know, parties are interest aggregators. They're not necessarily a delegate for their, uh, um, for their uh, voters in quite the same way, or, you know, simply a person of high standing that a community has entrusted to, to represent them. They operate on very different norms and logics, some of which are highly perverse compared to an individual. Um, but, you know, like I'm not saying that a legislature full of independence is great because you get a lot of corruption as well. Like, you know, it's not mutually exclusive. Parties are really good at extracting resources from the state um, and that can have really perverse impacts on, um, you know, the quality of governance or our perception of the quality of um, government, you know. But I don't want to kind of say that parties are all bad, you know. They, they do provide a really important um, function in our um, society, but it's one that they are struggling to really maintain. We like to think of political parties as what we call a democratic linkage between you know, us, the voter, and you know, this bigger interest aggregating group um, that kind of maintains like a link between society and government through the activities of, of parties. And in essence, political parties in the Australian system are, are becoming weaker and weaker. This is a, a worldwide phenomena. And they have basically worked out that they can occupy number uh, office and wield great power by having with by and still have incredibly low party membership and, and very poor um, linkage with the actual civil society uh, kind of uh, structure out there okay and so it is the the changing nature of, of parties and how they behave which has um, you know for good and ill um, uh, changed the way our system kind of operates. And if we look at the Senate, it's actually a lovely kind of um, example of this. So, you know, I won't go on too long because I know we are coming up to time, but in essence, um, 
at the Federation debates, uh, there was a really big fight about whether or not to give, you know, this second chamber, the Senate, all of these um, powers. And one of the main reasons why um, the, the sort of advocates for a large degree of powers won the day was because, you know, they were like, you know, colonial premiers and um, sort of thought that the colonies were a really big deal and that that should be the case. But there were also advocates who were really interested in the sort of deliberative capacity of a powerful second chamber with its own separate mandate. And um, in essence, um, in a kind of great irony or, or, or just it's, it's amusing, is that um, they basically couldn't quite come to an agreement on what to do. So they just wrote down all the powers of the House and all the powers of the Senate and kind of hoped that common sense would prevail in any disputes between the House. And, you know, we, we talked about 1975. And there, in that case, you know, in, in effect, common sense did not prevail and it, and it blew up in everyone's faces. And from about 1910, when the party system was solidified to about the 1960s, the Senate was like a real sort of sleepy chamber. Um, the voting system at the time, um, for a long time until the, to the late 40s, produced super majorities and, um, you know, people didn't understand that by voting differently in the Senate, they could effectively elect two different legislative parts that are doing two different jobs, okay? Uh, and in a great irony for Whitlam and Lionel Murphy, they were sort of at the forefront in the late 60s for starting to advocate for um, the Senate's powers, right? Powers that were always there, but they were in effect almost like rediscovering them or, you know, bringing them to the surface and advocating for their expansion and their role. And it was sort of after that that the Senate really took on a life of its own. So the, the DLP became a third force in the chamber. People started to realise, well, actually, you can vote for someone else. And then that sort of led to all of these other sort of chain reactions, which is, you know, oppositions essentially realised that, um, you know, if the government doesn't control this chamber, we can introduce legislative instruments like our powerful Senate committees, which have gotten more powerful over time. And the standing orders are in the Senate are now very different to what they uh, used to be and they're very different from how they are in the House. So, you know, um, basically the opposition parties working with the government, the government had to work with the opposition parties in the late 80s and early 90s, renovated the Senate standing orders to be much more deliberative and that's why Senate question time is um, more orderly, more deliberative, some might argue more boring, but I don't think so. Um, and that's sort of an example of parties, right, coming to realise that there is actually power to be had in this institution that we can kind of, you know, um, push to our own ends. And, and so, you know, parties aren't self, are they, they are self-interested actors. They don't always act in the, the sort of um, best interests of the system, but we have been quite fortunate that many of the things that they um, have done to sort of give themselves more power, in this case, increasing um, uh, the sort of gravitas and sort of um, actualising the powers of the Senate has made that chamber the much more deliberative, representational and scrutineering body that it is today. Okay. So I'm about to wrap up. So if we think about, okay, I've given you a lot of information. If we think about institutional renewal, well, we kind of know people are, um, you know, pretty unhappy with uh, politics, even though um, these figures come from the AES, and I think I'm pretty sure Ian McAllister is in this room, so I'm sure he can answer all your AES questions. Um, um, but you can kind of see that, like, satisfaction has kind of picked up again after this current election, um, but, you know, it remains, um, you know, um, that, that we still have um, still a lot of grumpiness out there. Trust has recovered somewhat, but, you know, there's still a lot of distrust uh, uh, in, in this sort of political system. If we consider, what's this one? Um, if we, I mean, I find these figures about who the government is run for, like, really disturbing. Um, you know, in, in essence, um, more than 50% of, of the population thinks that uh, politicians basically are running government for themselves. Like, that's scary. Um, and that they have no idea what ordinary people think. 
right? Um, what is really interesting to contrast with this is that people still think their vote really matters um, and that who is on the ballot matters. And that's, you know, I think a very kind of hopeful thing. And so when we think about what people don't like about the, the political system, is part of it is clearly really cyclical, right? And then in general, the data kind of shows this. Like when you have a change of government, you generally have a recovery in like a lot of these measures. And, and that's why 2013 was such an outlier because we saw no recovery um, in this sort of you know, trust measures or satisfaction measures. And it seems like people actually have a fairly strong confidence in our political system overall, all things considered, but they don't like politicians as a class of actors, okay? Um, and, um, and that they still think voting matters. So there's a lot to work with here, but it kind of points to the problem of political parties, right? And who is being sent in um, to represent us and how we kind of feel about that. And the political system has responded by these voices of Antille movements, by this really exciting grassroots organising and activity. But the thing is, is that, and, you know, and that has, and, and this has definitely sort of improved all of those proportional representational norms that I've talked about. But the thing is, is that, you know, these are not institutionalised. So they are currently effectively depend on a great deal of civic enthusiasm and engagement and organise, uh, volunteer organised labour and let's face it the resources of um, you know um, powerful and wealthy people there's no guarantee that this enthusiasm um, and this kind of civic engagement will actually sustain itself or, or go anywhere and it kind of points to the fact that well if we really don't like how our current system operates then we probably actually need to think of some more sticky institutional sort of shifts and so there's actually like heaps of things we could do some of these are much better ideas than others and I'm happy to sort of discuss them but um, they're the kind of things that might actually start to sort of permanently shift the spider gram one way or another. So, you know, we could add the number of members primarily to kind of deal with party discipline. This one is of intense debate in the literature as to whether or not that's a good idea. We could think about increasing the size of the Senate, um, e um, even if we had to maintain the size of the House, a bigger Senate would theoretically improve the dimensionality, for example. Um, we can, because, because we have um, one part of the legislature that does the job of uh, providing confidence to the lower house, to the government, uh, we could actually experiment with a more uh, PR-driven system in the in the upper chamber, a more uh, representative or proportional system, without actually threatening stable government. Okay, which you know would be low-hanging fruit and and much easier to do. Um, and we could, if we were getting really wild, uh, think about like alternative forms of representation. So we could hand over part of the upper house to a sortition model, which is where you basically do politics like it's jury duty, and bring in people into the political system who are otherwise not going to enter. So, uh, you know, like Jackie Lambie is a really good example, or Ricky Muir, a really good example of people who would not normally be, become involved in politics, who had something to say that we haven't really heard for a very long time, because it's really difficult for people from that kind of social background to actually get into a political party and get elected in the first place. The point is, is that we, that by doing these things, it doesn't mean that we wouldn't be taking any risks. Yeah, we would. Some of them might be, these might be terrible ideas. We might have a parliament full of MPs or, or, or senators you don't like. But the, the point that I want you to take away is that our system is semi-parliamentary. It's already doing the job of doing one job in the lower house, the low, one part, and another type of job in the Senate, the other part of the legislature. So we could probably afford to mess with this a lot more than, well, mess is a pejorative word, than we kind of do. Now, uh, you know, I don't think my idea is very popular. No one's ever heard of this. And, you know, this graph showing that people don't really like the government um, not controlling the Senate suggests I've got an uphill road to go on convincing people that this is a great idea. But perhaps that's because we are still thinking as if we are operating in a parliamentary system and not a semi-parliamentary system. Thank you and any questions? So.
Thank you, Dr. Taflaga, for a fascinating lecture. Um, we do have some time for questions. We've got two roving microphones, so if you just want to put your hand up, if you've got a question, we'll get a microphone to you. Um, and I think I can see a hand up down here. Yeah, uh, the definition of pure parliamentary system at a fairly late entry, I'm not sure I really grasp what the benchmark is that we were contrasting to. Yep. So now what is a pure parliamentary system? Uh, it basically is where you have only effectively one part of the legislature that is responsible for all the jobs. So it does the representing and the, the supply and the confidence. And so um, if you sort of think about it, our system kind of has the second part and the parliamentary system does it. Does that uh, make more so sense? So do you mean a unicameral? No, it doesn't have to be unicameral. It's just that, so for example, the House of Lords um, is, is, it doesn't do the best job of um, being terribly representative and it's not a meaningful challenge to the lower house. The lower house is where all the action is effectively happening. If, if the House of Lords um, evaporated, would it really affect how the political system operated? Not much, right? And so, but if the Senate, uh, you know, um, was vaporised tomorrow, it would have a profound impact on how our system works. And that's because it has those, um, the near absolute veto, its own separate mandate. Um, and it, that's, yeah, it's, 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 in essence, it's about those extra powers that it has. The fact that it's near equal and it has this sort of um, effective veto. Does that, does that help? Uh, which is the non-parliamentary bit of our system? Uh. Okay, it's the, it's the fact that we have a part of our legislature that is um, equally as powerful as the bit that is responsible for hiring or firing the Prime Minister. So the Canadian system or the UK system doesn't have that second part. Does that help? Excellent, excellent. Um, and can I see any other hands up for a question? Just down here, thanks. Thanks very much for a very interesting lecture. I think I need to hear it all again. Yeah, um, but looking at uh, changes recently yeah. in Australia, mm. in the Senate, where we the relationship between parties and um, different roles of review and so on, not wanting you to comment on the Australian situation, but if we have in other countries people who switch sides or you know move out of a role, how are they replaced just by a new appointment? I guess the House of Lords, you know, d does the inheritor of the title take over? And what happens in New Zealand especially? Oh, okay, that's a great question. Um, it would really, I mean, there are like, there's a whole kind of, there's, there's sort of, there's actually sort of six types of executive legislative relations, some of which are really rare or like historically existed and were terrible and so they got rid of them. Like Israel's experimented a lot with um, systems that they, they decide are crazy. Um, so it would just sort of depend. I mean, I think, I have no idea how they replace people in New Zealand, but they only have one chamber, um, which is all elected um, on a PR system. And I, I assume it's a party list system. And so it would probably just be the next person on that party's list. Um, but in the case of defection, um, well, I guess if they haven't quit, then... Yeah, I don't know. That's a great question. Um, I guess in the Australia... Say that again? Could you find out the answer? Oh, yeah, I could. I mean, Ian, do you know? Ah, oh, do you know, Matt? I'll say that. Okay, so in the Scandinavian systems, uh, it just goes to the next one on the list. So if you decide that you, you want to step down as an MP, uh, then the next on the list. So if you're a social democrat at the top on the list, then it just goes to number two on that list. However, the problem has been in, in a number of the Scandinavian countries is I think last time in Sweden, it was about 10% who defected and were sitting as independents. Uh, and then they were urged to step down, which they rarely did. Yeah, so I guess if you, that sort of is the situation that we that we have here, right? Like, 
it's a tension, like technically no one's broken any rules because they, um, you know, they've been sworn into the chamber, but normatively they're no longer performing the function of representing the parties under whose label they were elected. Because when you're elected in the Senate, you're typically elected under a party kind of label. So it's, it's the sort of spirit of the rules rather than the black letter law, yeah. I think we've got time for one more question. If we had anyone with a final question, down here. Uh, Sylvia? You emphasised that the Senate uh, doesn't have any confidence powers in terms mm -hmm. of getting rid of governments. But isn't that effectively what happened in 1975? It wasn't a confidence vote, but by, like, by not being confident in the Senate, that was the end of the government. Yeah, yeah, so that's the strong, um, that's the veto power, right? So the Senate absolutely has a veto power, and I guess that's why the dispute arose in the sense that uh, the, they used what was in effect a near absolute veto power over the budget. And um, Sneddon forced Whitlam to an election in 1974. Um, uh, you know, because ultimately Whitlam agreed to go to that election. And uh, so when they're effectively trying on that tactic again, um, you know, Whitlam kind of became more uh, recalcitrant. But in effect, he was moving towards doing the same thing again, going to an election because that was the sort of mechanism. So yeah, you're right. Uh, but it's not, a, it's not actually the ability to fire the government. So, for example, if a no confidence motion passed um, in the House of Representatives today, well, Anthony Albanese would be obliged to go to the Governor General and say, you need to find a new Prime Minister. But um, failing to pass the government's budget doesn't mean that Anthony Albanese has to go to the Governor General and tell him that you need to find a new Prime Minister. It creates a hell of a lot of problems um, which have to find a solution, but he, he doesn't necessarily have to quit immediately. So that's, I guess, the sort of distinction, yeah. Okay, I think that that might be all that we've got time for. Could you all uh, join me in thanking Dr. Aflago for her presentation? A recording of the lecture and the information about future lectures it will be available on our Senate Lecture Series web page on the APH website. If you're not already subscribed, uh, can I encourage you to sign up to our email address. Uh, the subscriber sign-up sheet is um, up the back, I understand, or you can email us at research.sen, that's S-E-N, at aph.gov.au. And that concludes our formal proceedings. Thank you.